Bless the Lord Jesus. I want to greet you in the mighty name of Jesus, our soon coming King. Amen. I find a privilege one more time for us to be in Bible study. And I pray God that at the end of tonight's session, again, like all the other times, that somebody would have learned something from the word and that will be blessed. Amen. For the word of God is quick, the Bible says, and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So it's a privilege to be imparting the word to you and to break bread with you one more time. Before we start, let us bow our heads as I open in prayer. Great God, we thank you for tonight. We thank you, God, that you are here with us. We thank you, God, that your word encourages us to go on. We pray right now tonight, God, as we are about to embark on another study. I pray, God, that you will be with us. You'll open our understanding that we might understand your word. Your word is spirit and your word is life. So we pray tonight, God, that every hearer of the word will be blessed. Thank you one more time, Lord Jesus, for what you are doing and for what you are doing in our lives as we look to you, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. God bless you. You know, tonight we'll be talking on the topic, just keep fighting. And it's just an interjection to what pastor has been teaching. He has been teaching on the topic, amen, about the church and the, 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 the bema or the judgment seat of Christ. And we know that he spoke about us getting rewards and, and what is required and what we'll get. Amen. And God is trying our motives and all of these things that he has spoken about over the past few weeks. But I'm here to encourage us tonight as we run this Christian race to encourage each and every one of us that irrespective of where we are in the race, irrespective of where we are uh, in this Christian walk, I don't want us to ever give up, but I want us to keep trying, keep fighting, um, knowing that you are not alone, you know. Um, the, the, it was the responsibility of the shepherd to ensure that wherever the sheep goes, he would protect them. The Bible says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me, you know. So sometimes the rod uh, might give you a little, you know, uh, as it were, might, 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 might give you what needed to be done for you to get you back in line. And his staff might wear off the, 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 the um, predators from coming to get you. But what is important for the sheep is knowing that the shepherd is there. So I'm here to encourage you that, look here, God is with you. And it doesn't matter what has happened in your life. It doesn't matter what you have faced over the years. It doesn't matter what it is. At the end of the day, I'm here to encourage you tonight that you should keep fighting. Keep running. Keep going at it. Don't give up. Uh, because at the end of the day, you are not alone and God is with you. I'm going to go to the slides as we go through tonight. and As we try to, to see how best we can uh, deal with this topic tonight. Keep fighting. Just keep fighting. You are not alone. Now, as I said before, in, in, in life, we often face a lot of trials and sometimes challenges and, and moments of despair. And these moments can let us feel alone and sometimes overwhelmed. Amen? However, as a believer in Jesus Christ, we need to realize that there is the word of God there to encourage us. And there are many things that has, has come to us. Even this world, this world seems to be a very dark place. A lot of things are happening. You know, we, 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 we hear so many things on the news that is bomb, um, creating chaotic in our minds. As we look at, at, at all the issues that are there. You know, people are losing jobs. People are worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. And I don't think that these things that are happening are happening independently of people who are in the church. Even though we're in the church, we too are affected by what is happening out there. We too are affected by the issues that are taking place in this world. So for example, we look at the whole thing about, uh, according to the World Health Organization, it's said to close to 800,000 people die every year by suicide. 800,000 people every year die by suicide. And, I'm, and according to the statistics, which is not on your screen, it is said that about individuals between ages 15 to 29 years old 
die are, are, the, are the one who are practically taking part in suicide so suicide is, is considered to be the second leading cause of death among persons who are between the age 15 to 29 now that's that that, that that's a high statistics um they said that men are more likely to die of suicide than women in other words the the, the, the devil is finding it fit that he will attack the men so so in these statistics we realize that the men are are the ones who are more committing suicide than the women then we look at the whole thing about depression depression it is said that more than 26 or 264 million people worldwide suffer from depression and depression is something that is affecting people from all ages people who are children adolescents adults you know and in this case it's a women are more likely than men to experience depression you know um but depression is is, is something that is happening globally so as a child of god we realize that there are challenges there are obstacles there are, there are moments of despair that is affecting people and why I put this out because it affects even our walk. It affects us when, when people are depressed, when people are troubled by what is happening around them. It affects them. Not only that, we, we, have, we have issues like uh, a lot of obstacles and, and diversions that is also affecting the church. You know, for example, social media. And it's interesting because a lot of people, and I, and I see a lot of, especially our young people, they are hooked on things like social media. And they are saying that social media, when you embark in it too much, it increases the rate of anxiety and depression. So we just spoke about depression and showing that depression is, is, has a high percentage or a high number every year. And just the use of this continuous social media in your face causes that. It causes sleep um, disturbance. It causes... Um, what I'm called FOMO, which is the fear of missing out. And, and, and young people are experiencing this. You have stuff like cyberbullying and online harassment. You have, you have people who are addicted. And, 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 and the whole social media has also reduced predict, pro productivity because people now spend so much time on this. And these are the things that, that, that are obstacles in, people, in our way as we go this Christian walk. You have stuff like um, pornography. Again, uh, back in the day, people used to have to go to a video store to, to get access to this type of content. No, it's right on your phone. You can, you, can, you can just type a URL and you're right there. And what is bad about it is that it becomes addictive. And it's, it becomes a compulsive behavior. Amen. Research suggests that pornography can lead to addictive behavior. Um, with, with people actually experience difficulty in controlling their consumption. It becomes so hard because it's, it, for, your, for, for your exposed to it, there is a lot of trouble. Amen. It comes about distorted sexual expectations. You know, people get into marriage and because they have been feeding themselves on this for a while, it affects their marriages. You have emotional and psychological consequences. And all of these things, brothers and sisters, are obstacles that we are facing in the 20, in this time. A um, lot of obstacles and diversions that are taking place. Praise God. We talk about peer pressure. Peer pressure. Um, it's, it's difficult as, 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 as an apostolic. When you go to school and you, 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 you're stuck out like a thumb, you know? And there are people are saying, boy, why you can't do this? Or why you have to do this? Amen. Why you are not allowed to do that? There's a lot of, of, of peer pressure in terms of how do I operate in school when everybody else look at this thing and it seems as if it is school. But what is happening? Why am I have to be different? You know, uh, it's not like in the days of the, of the three Hebrew boys who left their promised land and went down to Babylon. And even though they were able to stand out, I don't think they had as much as, as much as peer pressure as we have it today. And because of that, a lot of people become um, depressed. A lot of people become sad. 
A lot of people have, have anxiety. A lot of people have FOMO, fear of missing out. A lot of people have mental health issues. One of the big things now they're talking about is the whole issue about mental health. Amen. You're talking about bullying. You're talking about um, academic performance. You're, you're, you're actually trying to compete with so much different people and um, people go on the social media for example and they see people living the high life and they feel that they should try to live this life also which really is a facade uh, in most of the cases because a lot of these people who embark and they they do a lot of these social media things when you really check out their real life they are depressed they are sad they are trying to please the crowd i mean people put up things on their their phone and they go back and they check every five minutes to see if nobody like it and if nobody don't like it after a period of time they feel sad about it and these things affect affect young people and i'm here to encourage somebody that look here in this christian walk god is saying to you irrespective of the obstacles that exist irrespective of the things that are there god is here to tell somebody that you should keep fighting don't give up you know you you, you might feel like boy this is the end of the road but the bible says to him that is joined to all the living there is hope for a living dog is better than a dead lion. And it's interesting that the writer uses the term lion and dog. Because normally the dog would be the lesser in power and strength and might and all of these things in comparison uh, to the lion. But yet still the Bible is saying a living dog is better than a dead lion. Let me put it to the Christian point of view. Being a child of God, amen, you might not have all of these things out there. You might have all of the things that you need. But once you are in God, praise God, it is better for you than anything else that exists in the world. The Bible put it this way. What will it profit a man uh, to, to, to gain this whole world and lose his own soul? But I'm not, I'm not trying to belittle how you feel. I'm not trying to belittle the fact that as you run this race, there are obstacles that exist. Praise God. But guess what is encouraging for us? There are scriptures, praise God, that provide some form of encouragement and provide some solace for the believer. While we are running this race, while we are on the track and we are running the race and it feels lonely and it feels depressing and it feels troubling and it feels like there's, a, that there's this thing on you, there are some things in scripture that is there to encourage you that you can go on. Let me say it again. Just keep fighting you are not alone so the bible reminds us that we are not alone in our struggles amen i wonder if somebody get that that issue that you are facing that thing that is bothering your mind amen god is touched with the feelings of your infirmities. He wants to remind you from the world that you are not alone in your struggle. It's through the word of God that he wants to encourage us to keep fighting. He's saying to you, look here, there is something ahead of you. When, when the Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 said, these things, three things remain, faith, hope, and charity. Notice the three, the three pillars. Amen. So he's encouraging us to keep fighting. He's encouraging us to hold on to hope and to rely on God's strength. Amen. Let me say that to somebody. The word of God serves as a beacon of light in this dark world it reminding of reminds us of god's presence and god's support amen as we run this race so god didn't put you on the track on the track for you to be there by yourself god has given you the strength god is right there encouraging you god is right there telling you brother that you can make it god is right there telling you sister that you are able to make it praise god and to make the point, we're going to explore from the word of God. We're going to uncover some empowering scriptures that, re that, that inspire us to persevere, reminding us that we are never alone in this struggle. 
Amen. I, I, I wonder if somebody could even just type that. I am never alone in this struggle. Let it rest in your mind that you are never alone in this struggle. Philippians 4 verse 8 says, I'm finally brethren. Whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are pure, whatever things are of good report. If there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things interesting that the apostle paul said think amen because he knows that sometimes there's going to be trouble on the outside because if you read the rest of that philippians chapter 4 he says he knows how to be hungry and he knows how to 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 to, to be full he said he knows at times when he are base and sometimes when he's when he's when, when he's when he's high in, in talking about all of these things but at last he says look here i can do all things through christ who strengthens me. The, the, the good thing about that scripture is that the all things there is sometimes we look at that verse and we take it from the perspective that all things are all good things. But if you read the verses before verse 13, he was talking about the struggles that he's going through. He was talking about the issues that he's facing. And he was saying that irrespective of what comes my way, I'm going to think on the positive things. Amen. I'm going to think on the word of God. I'm going to think on whatever things are honest, whatever things are just. And guess what? When I go through all of these things, the ups and the downs, I can do all of these things. The ups, the down, the hungry, the struggle, the hard times, the good times, the bad times, when you are friends, when you are no friends. I can do all things, but not by yourself. Through Christ, who, what, strengthens me. And therefore, we find a few scriptures and examples that clearly state this point that I'm trying to make to you. You are never alone in your struggle. God is with you. And let us just jump right to what the Bible says in relation to this. Just to make the point. So for example, the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 10. He said, fear thou not, my God. For I am with thee. He says, be not dismayed. For I am thy God. He said, I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness, my God. So here the scripture is telling us, first of all, we should not fear. For God is with us. God is encouraging you that in that dark season, in that time when you feel lonely, when you remember the bad things that you have gone through, God is encouraging you not to be afraid. He's assuring us of his constant presence in our lives. Whatever challenges or obstacles we face, we can find comfort and courage knowing that God is by our side. He said, fear not for I am with thee. He said, be not dismayed for I am thy God. And this may refers to a feeling of discouragement. Talking about a feeling of confusion. Amen. That's what it means by dismayed. It means a feeling of despair. And God is reminding us not to be overwhelmed or to be disheartened. Because guess why? He is our God. He is, and guess what? We don't serve any puny, puny God. He is sovereign. He is powerful. And he's in control of every situation. What am I saying to you? As you run this race, as you go through this race, God is saying, amen, just keep pressing on. God is saying, keep going. God is saying, uh, keep fighting for I am with you. You are not alone. He says, I will strengthen thee. God promised us with the strength we need. In other words, the strength that we need to go through this race is going to come from God. He said, we, we, when we feel weak, I will feel incapable. He said, he will empower us and enable us to overcome difficulties. My God, we can rely on the strength of God and find renewed vigor. Through him. He said, Yea, I will help thee, my God. God assure us, amen, of his assistance. Amen. When the situation seems so hard, when you get knocked down, when you feel like this is it, when you feel like your mind is going to blow, he said, Yea, 
I will help thee. He says, in other words, he said he is not distant. He's not indifferent to the struggles that you feel. He said he's actively intervening, praise God, on your behalf. He's extending his help and support. And whenever you need it, he say, yeah, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. So God promises us to uphold us with his righteous right hand. And this, this imagery that the writer wanted us to get is that it signifies his unfairness feeling support is unfeeling support is unfeeling protection is unfeeling guidance and he said he will sustain us he will keep us he will secure us in his righteousness and faithfulness overall i believe the writer wanted us to understand and give us a powerful reminder of god's presence of god's strength and god's aid in our life as we run this race, as we run this race and there's a prize ahead of us, God is saying, keep fighting. God is saying, don't give up. God is saying, keep at it. God is saying, you are not alone. And if that will bring home the point, we look in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 9. He say, have not I command thee, be strong and have a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithsoever thou goest, my God. In other words, the scripture says God is assuring Joshua, and, 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 and by extension, God is assuring us, for all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. So just like the word was for Joshua directly, the word is for me. When I read the word and I'm going through my struggles, when I feel like, look here, I am alone. God is saying, for the Lord thy God is with you, whithsoever thou goest. God was assuring, as I said, Joshua, of his constant presence and companionship. Wherever Joshua goes, God is going with him. Amen. This promise signifies God's faithfulness. We serve a faithful God. It signifies God's protection. We signify God's guidance. Joshua can find strength again, we see. We can find assurance in knowing that the Lord is by our side. If that don't cement it, let's look at Isaiah, Psalm chapter 46 and verse 1. It says, God is our refuge and strength, my God. A very present help in trouble. The phrase emphasizes uh, the, 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 how accessible God's assistance is to you. In other words, he is not distant or an uninvolved deity. You know, in certain religions, what they try to do, they try to do these things to appease their God and they will offer and give up their children and they will cut themselves and they will do this. But God is saying he is our refuge and strength. And guess what? He is a very present help. He actively intervenes in the times of trouble. His help is timely. His help is reliable. And his help is available, my God. And he does that whenever we need it. But you might say, God, why it is that I have to go through all of these things? What is happening? God, sometimes it feels distant. But can I tell you something? God knows what's best for you. And God will never bring you through more than you can actually bear. You have to still trust God when there is a storm. You have to trust God if God stopped the storm. And, and the true test of your faith and love for God is not when the storm is over. It's when you're in the storm and you're still saying, God, you promised to be with me. And you can feel the, mind, the hand of God. That's what the Bible says. Think on these things. In other words, the, there must be an internal peace 
when there's external trouble and what is, is, is internal peace comes through the word of God. When you say, God, you are my refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. It does something in your spirit. And though the storm rage high, amen, they don't worry me for I am sheltered safe. There is something in my internal that says, God, you are my refuge. You are my city of refuge. You are my strength and you are very present help in trouble. But the Bible does just, just, doesn't just give us scriptures. It gives us examples of men who also have experienced sadness. That's why I love the word of God. You know, The word of God is not like the other religious, religious books out there who only speak about the good side. But to show that God is intimate with us. To show that God understands our struggles and understands our issues. The Bible shows examples of men and women who have experienced sadness and, and discouragement and depression. And God intervened to provide them with comfort. Intervened to provide them with encouragement. And intervened to give them a renewed hope in him. You see people like Elijah. And people like David. And people like Jeremiah. And people like Job. Just to name a few. But we look, for example, at the life of Elijah. After he had a victory, praise God, with the prophets of Baal, Elijah experienced extreme discouragement. <laughs> My God. Despite the great victory, he got a threatening message from Queen Jezebel. I can look at it in 1 Kings chapter 19 from verse 1 to 18. She vowed that look here, she's going to take his life in retaliation for the defeat of the prophets of Baal. And guess what? The man being a man, he was overwhelmed by fear. He was overwhelmed by, by exhaustion. You ever feel that way before as a child of God speak truth? There are times in our lives, praise God, where we experience some situation that we feel we feel exhausted. We feel like we can't go no more. You say, God, make me, me, me do everything. But God is saying, God is showing you that you are not alone in this race. You have had people who have gone through this before. Amen. Elijah do him do. The Bible says he fled to the wilderness. And he sought shelter, shelter under a broom tree. And he asked God to end his life. He said, it is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life. For I am no better than my father's. In, in his despair, in his troubled, Elijah felt alone and believed that his efforts were in vain. I know sometimes you come to church and, and, and you feel alone. I know you're in the crowd, but you're still alone. You do things for God and, 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 and the response, you know, there's nobody there to encourage you. There's nobody to say, boy... You know, because sometimes we are men and we, we need, it, 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 these things happen. The man felt overwhelmed. But I noticed how God responded to him. God responded with compassion and understanding. Because the Bible said an angel appeared to Elijah. And what did the angel do? The angel provided him with food and water. Ensuring his physical well-being. It, what did that tell me? First of all, God is so, God is so much in touch with us and love us that before the man the man ensured that him strengthened the man and then god instructed elijah to continue his journey to mount horeb which is also known as mount sinai and it was at this place in other words sometimes god has to bring you back to a mount horeb and a mount sinai to make you understand that look here i am with you i have not left you it was at Mount Horeb that Elijah experienced a series of powerful encounters with God. I remember those story. First, the Bible said there was a mighty wind. And then there was an earthquake. And then there was a fire. But God was not in any of these manifestations. I like how God operates. Because a lot of times, what we look for and what we want God to do is not necessarily God. Imagine, when we see mighty wind and we see earthquake and we see fire, this is a most God. But because of what the prophet was going through, he was dismayed, he was troubled. This was not the experience that God wanted to experience at this time. 
the Bible said, and God appeared to him in a gentle whisper, in a still small voice. And God assured Elijah that I'm talking, just like I'm, in, 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 I'm telling somebody tonight, God said to the prophet that you are not alone, my God. And there is still faithful followers of God in Israel. God, God, gave, God gave Elijah further instructions for his ministry. And God tell him instantly if you go anoint some new kings and appoint Elisha as his successor. But what am I saying is that having gone through this trouble, God was still with the man. The man experienced struggles and heartaches and issues and barriers and obstacles. But God is saying to somebody tonight, just keep fighting. Don't give up. Don't walk out. Don't leave the house. Amen. You are not alone. We see people like David. And in various Psalms, we see where David expressed his deep anguish and his deep sorrow and his deep feelings of being overwhelmed. One of the things that even mentioned here was Psalm chapter 3, where he had an issue with his son Absalom. And I've been teaching on Absalom at a different study. But Absalom was, was, was the man's prized son. The Bible talks about the man was beautiful in appearance. The man here was, 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 was beautiful. The man was beautiful from head to toe. But yet still, in Psalm chapter 3, we find that, they, that David was running from his life. The man was troubled. The man was, the man was feeling the pressure of what life is. Now for writing the scripture, how are they increase that trouble me? And many are they that rise up against me. My God, many that be that say of my soul, there is no help for me in God. Sometimes you feel like, God, where are you there? Where are you? You promise, I mean, I thought that when I got saved, my life would have been cherry. I thought that it would have been heaven and earth. But God, I am seeing struggles. I am feeling pain. But thou, O oh Lord, are a shield for me. My glory and the lifter of my head. We see now like Psalm, like Psalm 42, when we say, we, we keep on express to God, amen, how he felt, the troubles that he was feeling in Psalm 43, the, the discouragement that he was feeling as he went through his struggles. And, and, and one of the ones that stood out more to me was Psalm 22, where, where the famous quote where he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why hast thou forsaken me? We know that Jesus said it, but Jesus was quoting from David in Psalm 22, verse 1. And it tells you how David felt in Psalm chapter 22, verse 1. Why have thou forsaken me? This is how you feel at times. But God is here to remind you that he is your shepherd. You shall not want. We see people like, amen, we see people like Jeremiah. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. Can you imagine being a prophet preaching to a set of people and nobody listened to you? Amen. He faced great opposition. He created rejection. He had loneliness during his prophetic ministry. He experienced moments of deep sadness and despair. We look in Jeremiah chapter 20 verse 17 to 18. It expressed an anguish and frustration regarding his prophetic calling. He was saying, God, how is it that you call me to be a prophet? He lamented the difficulty he faces and ridiculed the experience as he, because of the message that God gave him. As a matter of fact, Jeremiah was so troubled that in, in, in Jeremiah chapter 20, the Bible said he felt that like he was deceived by God. He felt overwhelmed by his suffering. And he even wished... That he had never been born. My God. We look on Jeremiah chapter 15. He revealed the struggle he had as a role as a prophet again. The rejection and the hostility from the people whom he was sent. Imagine you go out and you go talk to people and nobody listen to you. He was saying, God, why have to experience all of this frustration? God, what's the purpose of all this hardship? And if you look at the end of that, God reassures Jeremiah of his presence and his promise to deliver him. 
You look at lamentation, the book of lamentation, where he wrote an entire book. The word lament means to weep. When Jeremiah looked over the city, the same set of people that he has preached to for years, he said, look here, you need to do this. You need to do this. And nobody listened. And because of that, Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed the city and destroyed the temple. And when the man looked and looked at the place that he called home being destroyed, it's like you go home and your place burned down. I saw a lady on the news quite recently and her house burned down. And she was saying, thank God that my house... But you could see, the, you could feel from the, 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 the news clip. The, the pain that the woman was feeling as she, ex she said the only thing that she have leave is the clothes on her back. She was just crying. She was happy that she have life, but she realized that she was like saying, we'll have to go start back over. You know, I think it was in the news this week or probably last week. Sadness. So when Jeremiah look at the city that he's called home, and it was in ruins, and it was destroyed, and it was burnt down, and the Bible said he, he, he wrote the book of Lamentation. He wept over the city he wept over the the destruction of jerusalem he wept over the exile of the israelites all it, would, all it did was just bring deep sadness and despair and experience it shows us then that god wanted us to understand that look here you 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 the, the, the sadness sometimes that you experience and the despair and the loneliness it shows you that God knows what you go through. And you're not the first. But in all of this, he said, I will be with you. I'm here to encourage somebody. Don't give up. There is a prize ahead. The, 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 this, 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 this race that you're a part of, there is a prize ahead. Praise God. Talk about Job, and we know the story of Job. I won't even go into that, but Job experienced great sorrow and wrestled with deep questioning about his suffering. Amen. He got through a lot of things. Him losing family, him losing health. And God answered Job. When, when he reached a point, God started answering him in the whirlwind in Job chapter from verse 38 to about verse 42. And God speaks to Job, revealing to him his power and his wisdom and his sovereignty. And he asks Job a series of rhetorical questions to demonstrate his supreme understanding and control over the universe. And through this encounter, Job gains a humbling perspective of God's greatness and of his own limited understanding. What am I saying? Is that God sees the bigger picture. And God sees, God knows why he has placed that obstacle in your way. Amen. In your mind, it is troubling. But God sees a bigger picture. We are sitting before an infinite God who is full of wisdom. And Job acknowledges his lack of knowledge and understanding. Amen. And God, at the end of the day, when Job comes to that understanding about what God was really doing, it was at this point that God turned and restored Job's fortunes and blessings. And even gave him greater prosperity than before. What am I saying? Is that your struggles... It's not just your st for, for, for struggling sake. But what is ahead of you is so great. It's going to be so magnificent. And you say, God, that's what this is for. Because you'll get a better understanding of the God that is with you. God is there. God is with you. Tell, I was going to say tell the person beside you. But at the end of the day, be encouraged. God is with you. Don't give up. Keep fighting, you are not alone. So as we look at the Bible study tonight, we will we look at six inspiring aspects from the scripture that should encourage and motivate us tonight that we must keep and we must persevere. You're going, you're going, I'm going to try to urge you to keep fighting. I'm going to try to urge some young person, some person that has been struggling, some middle-aged person that they, they, they thought that the marriage was going to be all that and it fell apart. Somebody who they lost their parents or they lost a brother they lost a sibling. Somebody who, who they lost a job. I mean, the thing that they thought would have sustained them. They had this life and all of a sudden everything went crumbling. Somebody who is saying, why am I experiencing this? I started this race so well. And, but now there is a crippling feeling. There, it is hard. God, what is happening? And tonight, 
You know, Pastor Dilly is talking about the judgment seat of Christ, the beamer. I'm here to tell you that there are some rewards ahead of you. There are some gifts for you. There are some prizes ahead of you. But guess what? Keep running. Keep running. There are six things we're going to look at as we try to, 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 to put this together. First, number one, in this Christian race, perseverance is essential. Number two, put on the armor of God. Put it on, brethren. Troubles come, but in your mind, ask God to help you to equip yourself. Number three, you are not alone. Number four, fight the good fight of faith. Number five, champions finish what they start. <laughs> and I'm here to tell somebody that you are a champion. You have come this far and God is proud of you. You might, you might buck your toe sometimes, but the fact that you're here tonight, even on this Bible study, probably fighting, probably struggling, God is saying that you are a champion. And guess what? Champions finish what they start. And I want to end by saying that victory is assured if you do this. Victory is assured. So let's start with number one. In this Christian race, perseverance is essential. Now, the Bible encourages us to keep fighting and not to give up in the face of trials and difficulties. Amen. When we talk about trials and difficulties, it's an inevitable part of life. It doesn't matter. Every person has trials and difficulties. And the trials and the difficulties that we will face, if you're a Christian or you're not a Christian, they can come in various forms. It's inevitable. You have personal challenges that we're going to face. You have adversities that we're going to face. You have temptation. But all of us experience trials and difficulties. However, we find that in the book of James, the writer encourages the believers to persevere and to remain Head fast in their faith when facing these trials. Look at what the writer says. Look at what James says in James chapter 1 and verse 12. He said, look here. Blessed is the man that endures temptation. For when he is tried... In other words, when the trouble come, when the issues come, when the, when, the, when the heartache come, when he is tried, he shall receive. At the end of the trial, at the end of the process, at the end of the race, he shall receive the crown of life. And I put the word Stephanos there and I, and I highlight, underline it and highlight it so we understand what it is. And I soon talk about that. Which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So, this blessedness that the writer is talking about comes from the assurance that their faith has been tested and proven genuine through their endurance. Pastor Dilly talk about your works going to be tried with fire. That's what he's talking about. You have been tested and guess what? At the end of the day, you are proven genuine through your endurance by holding out. You remain steadfast. And guess what? And these things demonstrate to us the love for God and our reliance on Him. So here it is. Let me say, if you do this, you shall receive a crown of life. The crown symbolizes eternal life. A glorious and abundant existence in the presence of God. I highlighted the word Stephanos. And the, the word Stephanos refers to a crown or a wreath that was given as a symbol of victory or honor in ancient Greece. There are two Greek words that are used for crown. You have diadem and you have Stephanos. Now, diadem is normally given to a king. When Jesus puts on his crown, is a dime. But when he gives you your crown, and the Bible says they cast his crown at their feet, that word is Stephanos. And that's a crown of victory. What am I saying? 
In this race, you need perseverance. You have to hold out and fight. Don't give up. Now, perseverance, brothers and sisters, goes beyond simply enduring trials, really, no. It involves two things. It involves actively and faithfully holding on to one's convictions and belief. Even in the midst of adversities. In other words, there are a lot of things that are coming that are going to challenge your beliefs and challenge your conviction. And we are living in a season where, where, where everything is being challenged. Gender is being challenged. What we wear is being challenged. How a Christian is supposed to look is being challenged. The doctrine is being challenged. It's like the darts are coming from everywhere. But God is saying, persevere, child of God. Acti this perseverance, as I said before, is actively and faithfully holding on to one's conviction. That conviction that you had when you got saved. A lot of us, when we got saved, nobody never needed to tell us to dress different. Nobody never needed to tell you that the skirt was too short or too tight. Nobody never needed to tell you as a man that, look, something is wrong with that. But over time, we have allowed our conviction to be seared with a tire and our, our, our conscience to become seared. But the person who perseveres is the person who actively and faithfully hold on to your conviction and believe. It's not that it's not hard, you know. It's hard. It's troubling. So, but you hold on to them. You're fighting. Even in the midst of adversity. It's a, it's a commitment to trust in God's guidance and promises. Even when the circumstances seem discouraging or overwhelming. When people are mock you. When people are saying, watch there. You, 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 you're not have to look so. God is saying you can persevere. Tell somebody, persevere. Keep at it. Keep going. Don't stop. Don't stop. Number two, we are called to put on the whole armor of God. Amen. Now, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10 to 18 encourages us to put on the full armor of God. Withstand the devil's attack. So we put on the full armor of God to withstand the devil's attacks. There are attacks that are coming. I mentioned earlier the, the attacks that come through the social media. I mentioned earlier the, the attacks that come with, with people being depressed. I see, I see people even in church feel depressed. They're, they're like a spirit of depression that has been moving through the place. People are, people are heartbroken. People are troubled. And let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. No matter, how, no matter how people look like everything is okay, we are all striving to make it. We all have our issues. We are all, some of us are broken people. Not, most of us are broken people that God is, has, is holding together. Because if it was not for God, a lot of us would be eating out of garbage bin today. But God promised to give us a sound mind. Amen. If it wasn't for God, a lot of us would not be here. We'd have been dead. With a turnover and dead with heart, with a with a, with a, with a stop beat long time. But God has given us some armor that we can use to withstand the attacks of the devil. We know some of these things: the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which the Bible says is the word of God. So here the apostle Paul communicates a powerful metaphorical depiction of the spiritual armor that believers are called to put on in order to withstand the attacks of the devil and to remain strong in their faith. What am I saying is that you're going to have troubles, you're going to have issues, you're going to have things coming but God didn't just leave you like that. What did God give you? God gave you a couple of things. He gave you first of all the helmet of salvation. The helmet Protects the head. What is the head? The seat of intelligence and thought. My God. So the helmet of salvation represents the assurance and the confidence that comes from knowing and accepting the salvation offered through Jesus Christ. And it guards the believer's mind 
against the doubt and the discouragement and the lies that the enemy will put at you. God is saying that, look here, put on the helmet of salvation because the devil is pointing doubt at you. The devil wants you to be discouraged. The devil wants you to give up. But there is a salvation ahead. Somebody say, but I'm saved already. Yes, you are saved to be saved. Because in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the Bible says that the trump of God shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise. Let the devil know that, look here, there is some things ahead of me that is going to blow your mind. My God. Then God said, must put on the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate protects the vital organs, which is like the heart. My God. So similarly, the breastplate of righteousness symbolizes a life lived in alignment with God's standard of righteousness. In other words, it's, it involves seek to live a morally upright and godly life, guarding your own heart against sin and the temptation of the enemy. God, give me a breastplate of righteousness. Cover my heart. God, cover my emotions. God, cover the, the issues, that part of me that's supposed to send blood around my body. Protect me. And I'm not talking about the physical heart. I'm talking about that, 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 that part of you, that central, vital, that organ that is supposed to pump everything else around. That's righteousness. And the breastplate of righteousness covers that. They talk about the, your, 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 your lines girded about with truth or the belt of truth. Amen. And in the ancient armor, this held together, everything, it, 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 it provides stability and the support for the rest of the armor. In the spiritual sense, the belt of truth represents the foundation of God's truth and righteousness. Remember I told you earlier that the, there are troubles and there are issues and there are there, 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 Things that are bombarding our minds. But I did say that thank God for the word. The word. Sanctify them through thy truth. Jeremiah 17, 17. John 17, 17. Thy word is truth. It's the word of God. That represents the foundation of God's truth and righteousness. It involves knowing and living by the truth of God's word. Which acts as a safeguard against a couple of things that are coming even in this time. The deception of the enemy. The enemy wants to deceive us. And the false wood. And men are creeping in unaware. Virgin, you can make it. But keep on the breast. Please have your lines girded about with you. They talk about the, the shield of faith. A shield serves as a defense against incoming attacks. The shield of faith represents unwavering trust and confidence in God's promises and protection. God, I know I don't see it yet, but I'm going to trust you. You know, the devil has said, no, 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 God, I'm not going to do it for you, but I put up my shield of faith. The devil said, you can't make it, but I put up my shield of faith. The devil said, look here, this is the end for you. You did something last year, and they got done with you, but I put up my shield of faith. Because guess what? My shield of faith says, hallelujah, it protects me against the incoming Attack against the, against the enemy. That unwavering trust. It, 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 it makes sure that I trust God. Irrespective of what I'm going through. It enables the believer to distinguish the fiery arrows of doubt. The fiery arrows of fear. The fiery arrows of deception that the enemy hurls and throws at you. And the Bible talks about the sword of the spirit. Which is, which is the offensive weapon in the ancient warfare. The sword the spirit refers to the word of God again. So it's both defensive and offensive. It's capable of discerning truth and combating lies. My God. It's able to dispel darkness. What a God. That's why it would have been the word. Scripture serves as a powerful tool for believers to combat spiritual attack and to live in alignment with God's will. I want you to understand that, that God has given you everything that you need. Now why did I talk about the, the, the utilizing the armor? I want, and not just for the armor's sake, but I wanted us to get one crucial point out of what I am saying. What am I saying? God has equipped us with all we need for victory. Let me say that again. God has equipped us with everything that we need for victory. 
You can run the race knowing that God is going to bring you through. Why? For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God. To the pulling down of stronghold. My God. In other words, Paul said that the weapon the believers use in their spiritual battle are not physical. They are not worldly. They are not natural. So unlike earthly warfare that implies physical weapons like swords or spears, or, or the spiritual warfare involves different means of combat. What are these? We have, we have things that are mighty through God. What are God? Paul affirmed that the weapons used by the believers are powerful. They're not just powerful, they are effective. These spiritual weapons derive their strength and effectiveness, not because of the believer, but they are mighty through God. It is through His power and in any in, in, in name that the believers are equipped. They are equipped now to face and to overcome the spiritual battles that they encounter. I'm here to tell somebody, look here, you can make it. You might drop one time, but keep running. You might bruise your knee, but keep fighting. If you mean you have to crawl, you have to make it to that finish line. Because your weapon pulled down stronghold. It tear down stronghold. Spiritual barriers, spiritual fortresses, spiritual systems of thoughts that oppose the knowledge of God. When you, God has given you everything that you need. All that I need, God has given me to run this race. Everything that I need to come out victorious, God has given it to me. False beliefs, false ideologies. Or any force that hinders people from coming to know and accept the truth of God's word. The weapons of our warfare, Hakabasata, are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of stronghold. Number three, you are not alone. You are not alone. And, 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 and you might say I said this already, but I want to emphasize it. So several passages teaches us. That God will never leave us nor forsake us. Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 16. Be strong and be of good courage. Fear not nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God. He it is that go. That thou go with thee. He will not fail thee. Nor forsake thee. Joshua 1 verse 5. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee. All the days of thy life. As I was with Moses. So I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Hebrews 13 verse 5. Let your conversations be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he had said, I will not leave thee, nor forsake thee. What a God. This, the, these passages support the fact that, look here, you are not alone in this fight. God said, look here, man, just as I was with Moses, I am also with you. I was with Moses through the fight. Joshua, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm here. And guess what? No, the devil wants you to feel like you're alone, like he did with Elijah. But let me tell you, you have support of others in the body of Christ. I have heard people call me, people I don't even know. And they said, I am praying for you. And I believe them because I know that it had to be the prayer of saints that keep a person like me. Listen to me, I am not the best of the best. I have done evil in the sight of the Lord. But somebody was praying, look, you don't give up. Somebody was praying and said, hold your space, hold your seat in Zion. Hallelujah. Keep on. Somebody was praying, somebody was there supporting me. I never see them, but there was a card that was extended to me. There was a hand that said, look, I will pull you up. And the devil don't want to know this. You are not fighting alone. Number five, fight the good fight of faith. Number four, fight the good fight of faith. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, Paul encouraged Timothy to fight the good fight of faith. Amen. And remain faithful to God's call on his life. Amen. In other words, for you to fight the fight of faith, you have to, be perse you have to persevere Brethren, in prayer, you have to be obedient to the word of God. You have, to be, you have to be willing to serve others. You have to endure the challenges and the setbacks. For the, the, for the journey that we are traveling is not without its challenges and its setbacks. And we, if, if you have been saved for any period of time, you know this by now. 
fighting a good fight of faith, we preserve, uh, persevering in our faith even when we face our adversities. It means don't allow the difficulties to discourage or derail us from our commitment to God. Instead, we must rely on His strength, rely on Him, stay committed. Require, don't, don't, don't let no devil pull you out. Don't let no man, no woman, no boy, no girl, nobody discourage you. Fight the good fight of faith. It means persevering in prayer, in obedience, in service, despite the challenges and the setbacks that come our way. I mean, we could say more on this, but because of time, fight the good fight of faith, the brother said. Lay hold on eternal life. We are to do also at call and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. And tell me here that scripture comes to my mind. What comes to my mind, what comes to my mind is this. One, the Bible says in Hebrews 12 and verse 1 that we are given many witnesses. No, let me not jump ahead of myself. There are some people that are watching you. There are some people that is waiting for you to come. Waiting for you to finish the race. Which brings me to point number five. You are a champion. I said that earlier. And champions finish what they start. Now, to bring home this point, I'm going to give you a little thing about in history. I, I, I always say, especially to some of my good, good young men friends, that whenever you see a story anywhere, they are never useless. I remember watching this thing and I book up a story about a guy. His name is John Stephen Athwari. He ran in the Olympics in, the 1960, in 1968. You can check it out. And he represented Tanzania in a marathon. And in this race, we could say it's a life-changing moment for this man. He was supposed to be one of the favorites for the race. But during the race, something happened. He suffered severe fall. And he injured himself and he dislocated his knee. <laughs> but guess what happened with this guy? What makes this event in 1968 very famous in the Olympics is this. Despite the fact that he was going through pain, anybody here facing pain? Despite the fact that he had, there was no chance of him winning this race again, the man decided that he was going to continue the race. His legs was bloody. He was limping. Hallelujah. But guess what? The man pressed on. Because he, was, he had an unresolved um, unwavering, unresolved to finish what he had started. But guess what happened? In the race, we see where the man encountered some obstacles. The obstacles were, I said before, his bloody leg, his knees dislocated. As a child of God, don't you sometimes experience some issues? Sometimes, as a child of God, we, we encounter obstacles, as I said before. There is a prize ahead. Sometimes we started out as the favorite in the race. But things come along our way and trouble us, my God. For some of us, it's doubt and unbelief. Amen. When doubts about our faith or the existence of God start to creep in, you go to university and people start pushing some things and it becomes distracting. And it weakens our resolve and makes us question our commitment to the Christian race. Sometimes you feel like, God, what is happening? This is so more logical. But sometimes God uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. But we have these things. For some of us, our obstacles are trials and challenges. Amen. Life is filled with trials and challenges that can shake our feet. And make us question God's goodness. God, why this have to happen to me? God, that was my only daughter. And you took her. God, me didn't love my husband. Why you had to die? God, why my child have to have this? And everybody else's children seem normal. God, why my son had to experience this? 
God, why it is that everybody else have a good job and me can't find one? God, why am I struggling? The trials and the challenges, difficult circumstances, difficult circumstances, the loss, the personal hardship. You feel overwhelmed and you feel like you're tempted to give up. Can I say to somebody, keep running. Remember this story, keep running. Then there is the persecutions and the, and the opposition, the ridicules, you know, uh, um, people, um, people coming against your feet. You feel fearful. Sometimes you feel discouraged. Everybody else at work seems to, 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 to be able to put on this and wear that and you have to wear. You go to school and every other child have on a, have on a, the girls them wear the tightest pants and the man them have on this and why me have to wear a skirt? God, we feel a way. We feel like we like about a state that we want to compromise. Persecution and opposition. The ridicule. The persecution of your faith. And it becomes daunting on you because God, why me? And then you have the failures. You yourself, you're going so good and out of the blue, this thing come your way and you feel, and you feel, you feel so dirty, you feel so, you feel so God, and you feel like everybody is against you, nobody likes you again, they hate you, the devil is putting on your face every day. When you do five years ago, when you do ten years ago, you'll never get forgiven, so you'll only remember for this. You feel God, you say, God, why me? Ha, kabaya. But there's a little song that we sing at church. It says, there's a race I must run. And there are victories to be won. Songwriter says, give me power every hour to be true. There is a race, brethren. You're running the race. And during the race, you're going to have these obstacles. You're going to have the trials. You're going to have the persecution. You're going to have the failures. You're going to have the downtime. You're going to have your valleys. You're going to have your troubles and your situation. But there is a race that time must run. And there are victories to be won. Give me power. Every hour to be true. You are a champion. Champions finish what they start. Because he was going through that situation. This African runner. And the runners cross the finish line. And they leave the man far behind. You know that feel? Everybody else is a way are you, head are you now. My God. By now, the stadium light start dim. Because it's a marathon. The man leg break. The man, the man practically a crawl to come in. And all the other runners were ahead of him. And most of the spectators who had seen what run the race left. The stadium light start go down low now. It's like you feel left behind. You say, God, I come to church. It's like, because of this situation, nobody sees me. God, there must be something that I can do in church. I only get to do this when the light goes down. I don't get to do so many things. Then. But God, see, can I tell you something? Just keep fighting. I remember days, let me tell you an experience, where I felt down. I remember days where I wanted to be a part of a particular thing. And I felt out of it. I was not given the time of day. You said these things happen in church. Yes, it does. But God over time showed me what he was doing in my life. Because while I was left alone and I was not invited to this. And nobody wanted to do this. God was preparing me for greater ministry. Because while I was in the, the desert when alone with the sheep. <laughs> when I was alone by myself with nobody. What I could I do? Go study Bible. And that I could I read. And God, see where God bring up all of those information from years and now I'm talking about it. You are a champion. And champions finish what they start. The scripture says, I returned and saw on the sun that the race is not to the swift. Nor the battle to the strong. God is saying that, look here, it's not because we are strong. You are mighty through God. Irrespective of all that he was going through, the man was determined. The man was unshaken. Despite his physical agony, 
despite his isolation, because by now everybody was ahead of him in the race, the man kept through. You see, long after the race, when everything finished, they see the man coming through. And you can find this video on YouTube if you don't believe. 1968 Olympics. And when the remaining spectators who were still in the stadium saw the man coming, probably they, 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 they cheered for the others when they came. But when they see this man coming, every spectator that was left rose to their feet. And they applaud his display of fortitude. God is saying that, look here, man, I know you're struggling, but there are some angels looking into the thing. And when them see you coming through, they're going to stand and they're going to applaud you. I want you to, to type, I am going to finish. I want you to type that, I am going to finish. Everyone say, I put your name, I'm going to finish. Say it. I'm here to tell somebody, it's not who you are today. In the eyes of God, it's who God is going to make you to be there. It's a finish line ahead of you. It's at the end of the race, they ask him a question. There's a little song I love before I go there. That, that has been on my heart recently. It says, trials here are sometimes many. And oftentimes my feet go weary. Till it seems I almost stumble and fall. But the tender hand that leads me is the hand that keeps me steady. And gives me faith that I will make it after all. Verse 2 says, by myself I cannot make it. But I know he's there to help me. Hallelujah. He will hear my cry and answer when I call. Keep on trusting and believing are the words I hear him whisper. God is whispering to somebody's ears. And just a few more days to labor after all. The chorus says, after all this life is over. And my burdens have been lifted. And I stand upon the mountain top so tall. Looking over to that city that the Savior is preparing. Give me faith that I can make it. After all, I am going to finish. So the ox, and this is the guy here. See him bandage on him foot? In 1968 Olympic Marathon, champions finish what they start. They ask him the question, why it is that you gave up? Why it is that you did not give up? He said, my country did not send me 5,000 miles to start the race. They sent me 5,000 miles to finish Habaya. God got you saved, not just to start, but to finish. God has sent you here to finish. And you know why you must finish? Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 to 2. We are foreseen, we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witness. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience uh, the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. That's a prize, brethren. The author and the finish of our faith, who for the joy. I love, I love God. He never does want to do something that he himself didn't go through. He went through troubles on the cross. He went through situations, but for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross. He despised the shame. And guess what? No, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. In other words, he sits now in a place of power, in a place of prominence, in a place of authority. And God is saying that, look here, run the race because there's a great cloud of witness looking to you. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witness. Who is that great cloud of witness? The faithful believers, we read Hebrews chapter 11, all of those men who have faith, who have gone before us in faith, they are looking back and they, 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 are, they, are, they are looking for you to come around the corner. Who is that great call of witness? The angels that look down. The, I was telling my Sunday school class on Sunday about the Ark of the Covenant and where the, the, the cherubs look at the mercy seat. The mercy seat is where the priests come and offer the blood on it seven times. And the Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, seven is the number of perfection. Amen. Which means perfect atonement. But guess what? The cherubims look down into the blood because they can't understand. You know, they're looking at something that they can't understand because when they fell, they didn't get it. But they're looking at perfect atonement for the hearts of men. What am I saying keep fighting 
if you have failed God, get up because there is a blood on the mercy seat. And the angel, the great cloud of witnesses, looking into this matter. What a God. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily entangles us and let us run the race set before us with patience. We should keep our focus on Jesus, who is the author and the finish of our faith. Jesus endured the cross and despised the shame for the joy set before him and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. I reach the last one. Keep at it because your victory is assured. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 57 reminds us that through Christ we have victory over sin and death. And we can trust that God will help us to overcome any obstacle. And that ultimately we will overcome our struggles in the eternal kingdom of God. Victory is assured for the person who decides he's going to persevere. Victory is assured for the person who decides that, look here, I'm a champion and I'm going to make it. Victory is assured for the person who realizes that he's not alone. Victory is assured for the man who decides that I might fall seven times, but guess what? There's something about me. There's something deep inside of me. God didn't save me. God didn't come how much thousand miles from heaven for me to, to just start this race. But God came so that you might finish it. The Bible says, and I close, and this is the last line, but thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Our ultimate goal in this Christian race is not just to finish but our ultimate goal is to finish strong. Finish. John, that guy there, uh, a quarry, teaches us that finishing strong is not dependent on our circumstance, but on our determination. In other words, he was leaping, but everybody clapped for him. Everybody stood for him. It's, it's not based on our circumstance, but on our perseverance. It's not dependent on our circumstance, but our unwavering commitment to honor God. God, I, I will honor you. Regardless of how far behind we may feel, let us resolve in our minds, brothers and sisters, to finish this race with courage, to finish this race with faith, and to finish this race with a steadfast heart. There's a race that I must win, I must run, and a victory to be won. Give you grace. I pray God will give us grace so that we can make it after all. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Brethren, keep running. Keep holding on. Keep going with Jesus. Keep fighting because you are not alone. Bow your heads as I pray. Great God, we thank you for the word tonight. Hey, Abba. We thank you, Jesus, that you have spoken to our hearts. I thank you that somebody tonight is encouraged that look here, they are champions. And champions finish what they start. We start this race strong. We might have had injuries along the way. Some of us are bloody. Some of us are weak. Some of us feel like, God, we can't make it. But there is a mental peace that says, look here, God, you are ahead of me. There's, there's Jesus' face I'm looking at who is saying, come son, you can make it through the finish line. God, we thank you that some person here who was backsliding in heart, somebody who thought that they can't make it, somebody whose struggles are so hard, somebody that is struggling, oh God, with situation, with hard takes and pornography and social media and peer pressure, somebody that has been troubled by the things of this world, is encouraged tonight that all these obstacles and these distractions, God, I am still going to make it. I might fall down, but I'm getting back up. I might be small like David, but I have a stone. And I have a stone to deal with a God like that. I might be like Joseph, who was thrown into a pit. But I know that there is a kingdom awaiting me if I just keep on keeping on. God, touch somebody's heart tonight as we look to you, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. In the mighty and the most exalted name of Jesus, I pray. 
in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Brethren, keep going. Keep at it. Keep fighting. You can make it. Amen. I just want to just close off by way of announcement that, you know, FAM, in collaboration with the Tarrant High School, will be having a wellness fair, a well health and wellness fair. And that's June 24, 2023. So you can save the date. So that's the health and wellness fair. Um, Faith Chap in a collaboration with Tarrant. Also, um, in this week, we have the memorial service for the late um, Reverend Victor Dose. It will be held at Faith Chapel UPC. That's at 1 Renfield Avenue. Amen. That's tomorrow for those who want to go and support. Feel free to go. And on Saturday, there is the Thanksgiving service for the man of God. It will be held at uh, Pentecostal Tabernacle. I think it's 11 o'clock it starts. So again, if you can make the time out to come, go and support. But guess what, brethren? I mean, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And the fact that this man of God has lived a life, he's in the presence of God. And let us endeavor that we too can cross the race. Keep fighting. Keep fighting. Keep fighting. God bless you in Jesus' name. I want to remind us of one more thing as I go. There's manifest coming up. Praise God. Remember manifest. Remember it in your prayers. I mean, there's some information that is going out on the social media in relation to in our WhatsApp group in relation to uh, manifest. Keep abreast of these things where you can support, do what you need to do. If you can go and support, go. Amen. Let's just have a good time in the Lord. God bless you again. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' name.